deep in the weeds on some of the bugs. I tried to keep it as general as I could because I know the bugs are kind of confusing to people. And names are difficult to spell and pronounce and et cetera. So I've tried to keep it fairly general, but um, nonetheless, we're gonna get into the weeds a bit. And um, I hope you're not eating dinner because I have some really cool gross photos of pneumonia and otherwise, so be prepared. So first of all, before I get too deep in the weeds, let me tell you a little bit about the Wildlife Health Lab. Um, we're part of the veterinary services branch of the wildlife division. We have a small laboratory within the Wyoming State Veterinary Laboratory. From there, we, we concentrate on many diseases, not just chronic waste and disease or brucellosis, but of course, respiratory disease and bighorn sheep, tularemia, uh, and of course, rabbit hemorrhagic disease, which is the disease du jour for, for 2021. In addition, we track all diseases in wildlife across the state. And we're a busy laboratory. We do about 16,000 tests a year on about 8,500 samples. Although I'm the one who you have to look at in this presentation, really the bulk of the work is done by those four gals that are pictured in the middle there, in that middle picture. Um, they do a tremendous amount of work and a lot of the great quality diagnostics that come out of this laboratory, particularly with bighorn sheep, where they've developed culturing techniques, sampling techniques, and just keeping those pathogens alive from the sheep to the lab is really the thanks to them. So um, uh, my hat's off to those four gals who really make all this possible. In fact, many of the pathogens we're gonna talk about today and the identification in Wyoming herds were, were because of the work that they have done. So before I take off, I think let's put some sideboards on respiratory disease and more importantly, my presentation. So respiratory disease is incredibly complex with a multitude of causative agents. And a lot of it isn't really fully understood by science. Certainly, we're starting to get a better appreciation for the complex interaction between the host, the pathogen, and the environment, and how all those interact to, to develop into respiratory disease or not, right? And certainly, because there's a complex interaction between all those different factors, each herd responds differently. Um, we certainly can't predict, given a particular bug, and a particular herd and a particular environmental circumstance, let's say, how respiratory disease is gonna play out. It's all very, both animal specific and herd specific. Just like coronavirus as it moves through the world, think how different populations have responded, different people have responded, just different ethnic groups, all those things, it's no different. Um, and that said, because we're still working on understanding all of respiratory disease, there's a lot of differing opinions and differing research findings as far as this disease is concerned. And um, I think if you had eight people here given the same presentation, you'd probably have nine different opinions. And um, we'd all have the same basics, but when you get down to the nitty gritty about which pathogen or which mode of action is more important, well, that's where may the differences may be. But uh, certainly everybody has a little different view on respiratory disease. So don't take mine for gospel by any means. Um, my presentation is really gonna focus on the bacterial pathogens. There's many other pathogens out there, uh, including viruses and other causes of pneumonia. Uh, but mostly what we see is bacterial, and, and that's what I'm gonna focus on. But keep in mind, there's, there's other things out there. So looking back, you know, you look back to the 1900s and the scientists of the time thought they had it figured out, right? 1900s, yep, we got it figured out, it's scabies. Then the 1960s came along and they changed their mind, nope, nope, it had to be lungworm. And finally, in the 1990s, it was Pasteurella hemolytica. Then finally, in 2000s, there was no doubt about it, it's mycoplasma ova pneumonia. So definitely as our diagnostic techniques have improved, as our um, science has improved, as our knowledge has improved, so is our realizations of what pathogens have, uh, are truly responsible 
But unfortunately, through history, we really focus on just a single cause, right? A single smoking gun. But, you know, still to this day, there's a lot of argument over which pathogen is the biggest and the baddest and kills the most sheep. And it's hard to imagine that in the future, as diagnostic improved diagnostic technique, techniques improve and history or science advances that, that we don't come up with something else that um, is likely to be the cause of pneumonia. And more importantly, it's not likely one thing, it's likely multiple things. And you're gonna hear me talk about that several times in this presentation. This is a multiple pathogen, multiple factorial disease. And I think as we move forward, we need to move beyond this focus on a single smoking gun, if you will. So that's kind of shown here in this disease triad, right? I think this is maybe a pessimist view, isn't it? Maybe it, it should be a health triad. So replace the word disease with health there because it's a balance. It's a balance, right, to maintain that health. It's a balance between the environment, that be weather, habitat, competition, predators, et cetera, to the pathogen itself, whether that be the strain type, the, whether it's a new pathogen, an opportunistic pathogen, and, if, and finally the host, the immune, the immune um, status of the host, the nutritional condition, as well as other diseases that animal may have. And how all those things interact to keep the animal in balance, right? But if it's able to keep some of these pathogens in check or if the pathogens are able to get uh, a better hand. So just picture these circles rather than being static like they here are on our screen, that they move, right? Depending on what's pushing them one direction or the other. So now is where your eyes are gonna start to glaze over because I'm gonna start digging into the bugs. Um, I guess I'm gonna apologize that from the get-go because that's, I'm a lab rat and this is what we do. And uh, I'm gonna talk about not just the bugs themselves, but how they cause disease and the difference between a new pathogen and an endemic pathogen and et cetera. But first of all, how do we find the bugs, right? When we go out and sample sheep, there's a couple of things we really are aiming for. And one of them is the tonsil. And you can see that blurry picture there. Uh, and just below that swab, I don't know if you can see my cursor from where you're at, but right there is a tonsil or crypt. That's where we really want to be. We want to put our swabs within that tonsillar crypt and sample the organisms that are there, not just the back of the throat and, and certainly not the feed that you can see sitting on top of that, that sheep's tongue. We really are aiming for that crypt. Once we get a good swab of that crypt, we then put it onto a Columbia blood auger plate, which is up in the top. It's a plate that's made with sheep blood, domestic sheep blood, and we know that those pathogens survive best on that. So we did get it from the sheep's mouth to, a, to the uh, plate as soon as we can. And certainly there's a lot of things that grow on that plate, as you can see in that one picture on the far right. And our uh, goal, and this is where the real skill in a lab tech comes in, is, is picking out those pathogens in amongst that sea of bacteria. Um, from there, we'll isolate it. We'll do many other lab tests. It takes us about two weeks um, to run through all the tests we need to do to identify a specific pathogen that may be on that plate. Another thing we do is we take an additional tonsil swab. We throw it into this media. You can see in the lower right, that media just holds it at stasis. So it's, there's no replication. It just keeps all those bugs alive. And then we also take a nasal swab. So we swab both nasals with the same swab. We insert it about four or five inches into that nasal cavity and then we slowly rotate it. So we could get a good sampling. We generally don't plate nasal swabs on a, on a, on a blood plate. We simply put those into that uh, transport media in the lower right and take it back to the lab where we look for, where we're looking for different organisms. So we expect to find some of the respiratory pathogens like hemolytica, and multocida, and biversteinia in the tonsil. Whereas the nasal, we're really looking for multocida, M. ovine, things like that. So there's certainly many pathogens, as I've mentioned, that cause respiratory disease. And I am not going to 
go through all those. I'm just going to really talk about some of the big ones. So um, there's mycoplasma over pneumonia, which is known to be a pretty significant cause of pneumonia in domestic lambs. Mannheimia hemolytica and Biberstinia triolosi. These are the old um, uh, Pasteurella hemolytica. They've been split into two different species now. And they're a, a big cause, in fact, the number one cause of economic loss in beef cattle. And then finally, Pasteurella multocida. This is a probably an underrecognized pathogen and certainly responsible for a whole host of diseases, including avian cholera, hemorrhagic septicemia, as well as pneumonia in many, many species. And then, then of course, when you get synergistic infections, when you get more, if you get a couple of these different pathogens that are co-infections, um, it can be pretty dang tough for the, for the host to, to um, uh, fight them off. So down in the lower uh, portion of the screen, you'll see two pictures of pneumonia. The one on the right is a typical mycoplasma pneumonia. You see it looks much different than the picture on the left, which tends to be more of a Mannheimia, Biberstinia, Pasteurella pneumonia. Now that's not to say that, that uh, MOVI couldn't be involved in that, but for the most part, that's the body fighting those, those Biberstinias and Mannheimias. So, I remember those pictures, we're going to jump to this next slide as we talk about mechanisms of disease. So both Biberstinia and Hemolytica produce what's called a leukotoxin. And a leukotoxin is, as the name implies, a toxin that kills leukocytes or white blood cells. And we know that bighorn sheep and doll sheep are both really susceptible to leukotoxins, more, more susceptible than domestic sheep. And the problem is, is when those leukocytes are, are burst, they release their cellular enzymes. Now, these are the enzymes they're packing that they use to rid the body of, of pathogens. They essentially dissolve them. So what happens is these enzymes are released. They're released into the local tissue where they cause, um, they start to cause some pretty significant damage. And then that damage recruits additional leukocytes. So you get this kind of a uh, cascade reaction where just more and more leukocytes are being called to the scene, more leukocytes are rupturing, more enzymes are destroying tissue, et cetera, and et cetera. And then that too can be exacerbated if, if there's lungworm larvae that happen to be present or even lung or even dust. Anything that's there that the body's gonna recognize as foreign, um, kind of keeps this cascade going and, and can actually amplify it. So um, you're going to have to use a little bit of imagination here. I'm not sure how well you can see this, but over on the, the upper left, there's a plate of, of, of hemolytica. So it's called hemolytica because if you look around that colony, you'll see a small halo. Now, if, if I was magic and can push that colony to the side here on this screen, you would see a clear spot underneath that um, colony. It would be completely clear. So that means that, that that bacterial culture is able to utilize the red blood cells that are in the media. So that's one way it got its name, right? The ability to, to um, hemolyze red blood cells. All right, uh, other mechanisms, M. over pneumoniae, is able to stop the cilia from moving um, uh, organisms from the lung uh, up the windpipe. It's able to interfere with that. So o M. ova pneumonia is not cleared from the body. Rather, it, uh, it remains in the lungs because the clear normal clearance mechanisms don't work. And then finally, uh, like multocida, it has a capsule on the outside of that bacteria. And this is a, a full culture of, or a pure culture of um, Pasteurella multocida. And you can see it's kind of slimy, kind of mucoid. That's that capsule that I'm referring to. And that really prevents the body or the leukocytes from removing that, that culture. So next I'm gonna talk about different classes, if you will, or categories. I'm not sure what the right term there is of pathogens. So novel is a new pathogen versus endemic or opportunistic pathogens, which tends to be resident pathogens. Then I'm going to talk a bit about strain types. So I really struggle to try and 
get this message across, although quite honestly, many of you are probably very well aware with all the news reports about, about COVID and the, and the South African strain and the New Jersey strain and, and all the different strains that are out there. This is exactly the same. I just picked some silly pictures of cats to demonstrate it. So if you think about novel, maybe that, that um, uh, lion there um, is, would be introduced as a novel um, uh, strain as opposed to the lazy kitty cat laying on the, on the porch doing nothing for 90% of the day. But for 10% of the day, perhaps that lazy kitty cat becomes an opportunistic hunter, right? An opportunistic pathogen, if you will, but able to um, uh, hunt when it's, when it's opportunistically correct. So you can also think of strain types, right? Um, I know this is a bit of a stretch, but you know, they're all cats. And think of, think of their ability to kill or hunt. They're all going to be much different between um, the, the leopard as opposed to the sleeping cat, as opposed to the, the cat who happened to, to catch that rabbit. So anyway, I'll start off with new pathogens. It's pretty obvious, right? Pathogens are, are new. They, the, the sheep and the pathogen have never been introduced. Therefore, that pathogen is not recognized by the immune system. And the, the sheep is a little bit uh, at a loss to be able to defend itself, at least with antibodies, against that pathogen given it, given it the upper hand. So depending on the pathogen and its time of infection, several things can happen, right? One is nothing can happen. The, the animal can be infected and it clears the organism and that's it. Two, the animal gets infected. It's unable to clear it, but it is able to keep it at bay and disease does not ensue. Or third, depending on the pathogen and the circumstances, uh, we could have an all AIDS die off. We could have decreased lamb survival or both. And when that happens, some herds probably never recover. A good example of that is uh, the Sinks Canyon subherd of, of Temple Peak. Um, you know, that, that herd after commingling with domestic sheep just, just was never able to recover. Another worry with new pathogens, though, is those sheep that survive the infection. Um, those, those pathogens continue to persist. If that sheep's unable to clear it, then it persists in that sheep, and then it persists in the population. And as we go through generations and we go into the future, those pathogens, which started out as being new, continue to circulate. And although the ewe may be able to keep it at bay, when she gives birth to her lamb, and because that lamb's immune system is not fully competent, then that lamb becomes susceptible to that pathogen, which is now endemic or resonant, if you will, and circulates within those populations. That's, that is the big problem with those new pathogens. And I'll, I'll talk about it here more with opportunistic pathogens. I've already talked about it a bit, but again, that, that animal is able to keep that bacteria in check. So it's causing little or no disease, but given the right circumstances, that, that bacteria is able to get the upper hand and um, cause disease. A good example of that is the, the Saega antelope with hemorrhagic septicemia when thousands and thousands of those animals died, probably because of stresses, which again, allowed that organism to get the better hand. Other examples include um, shipping fever in cattle um, with, caused by hemolytica and triolosi as well as chicken pox and shingles in humans, right? As we get older, our immune system um, gets less strong, let's say, and, and maybe there's some other stresses. That gives those organisms a chance to get a foothold and start to cause disease. Then I'll talk just a second about strain types, right? Strain types, again, going back to COVID, um, are just genetic variants. And certainly that, that difference in genetics gives that um, a bug uh, uh, the ability to have different uh, pathogenic traits, right? How pathogenic, how pathogenic it is really varies by strain type. And for the most part, a host immunity is specific to strain. Not always, but for the most part it is. And, and that's obvious through the flu vaccine. They recommend you get your vaccine every year. 
because the CDC has to forecast, okay, which strain is going to be active that year, and then they produce the appropriate vaccine. So always trying to, to, to match vaccine with strain type. Generally, those endemic pathogens are, are low pathogenic strains, right? Because they're not killing their host. And, and unfortunately, at this point, although there's, there's a fair amount of information out there on strain types in domestic livestock, there's very little information that's available in bighorn sheep. We're working on it. We, we certainly have a long ways to go, but we're working on it. And a good example of that is in the, the Laramie Peak herd. We happen to have a, a hemolytic strain that's, that's killed off uh, nearly a dozen sheep now. And we are able to identify that strain of hemolytica as a very pathogenic strain as opposed to the other hemolytic strains that happen to be circulating in other, our other populations across the state. So we're getting there, but again, we've got, we've got a long ways to go. And finally, this is my last slide on um, the bugs Then I'm gonna dig more into, um, I'll talk sinus tumors and I'll dig into more uh, respiratory disease in the state. So, Doug McWhorter sent me this, this um, clip out of a Wyoming Wildlife magazine from 1943. And I don't know if you can read it. I'll, I'll read it for you in case you can't, in case you can't, because it's very interesting. And it says, interesting photo, taken nearly 14 years ago in Sinks Canyon above Lander, shows mountain sheep, the ram, mingling with domestic sheep on range. Such association of bighorns with tame sheep is quite common, though it is more in the past when wild sheep had a wider distribution over the state. The bighorn pictured was killed by poachers and there are no mountain sheep in Sinks Canyon at present. So obviously, if this was taken 14 years prior to the 1943 version, we're about 1929 or thereabouts. So obviously, um, now, our, our native sheep have intermingled with domestic sheep in some form or another, almost all of our herds. And it's obvious, right, because bighorn sheep are attracted to domestic sheep, especially if those domestic ewes are in, are in estrus. It's a natural attraction. So the problem is, is because domestic sheep have co-evolved with many of these pathogens, right? Think of the way we treat our livestock. We take them to sales where they intermingle, we sell them, we trade them, we may mix one band with another. So think about that as a culmination of years and years and generations and generations that domestic sheep have had the opportunity to one, come in contact with incredible number of strains that circulate within their populations, their endemic strains, right? And two, they've developed the ability to become tolerant or resistant to those strains. But unfortunately, our bighorn sheep have not had that opportunity. So our bighorn sheep are very, very susceptible to many of those pathogens that are circulating within those um, domestic sheep. So we may say, hey, we found hemolytica in domestic sheep, and we found hemolytica in our wild sheep. Maybe the same bugs, but the strain types are much, much, much different and much more pathogenic in those, in those um, domestic sheep. But it's not just those pathogens we worry about, right? It's other diseases as well. Uh, Yoni's disease is a good example. Ovine progressive pneumonia virus is another. Beovus. There's there's many other diseases. But I think it's important here. I, I don't want you to give the opinion I'm throwing the domestic sheep producers under the bus. I'm certainly not. Um, this is you know what happened many 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 years ago. We've learned and we've learned to keep the two separate whenever we can. That's part of the Wyoming plan, right? That seeks to, to optimize that separation wherever we can. But there's certainly other species of concern. It's not just domestic sheep. It can be wandering bighorn sheep. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we have a policy of removing those when they're found outside the, their um, herd units. And it can be mountain goats. It can be several things. Whatever serves as a conduit for these pathogens, whether it's coming from domestic sheep or it's coming from other infected um, 
uh, bighorn sheep populations as far as that goes. All right, I got just a few slides on sinus tumors, another really important thing. We're just starting to get our head wrapped around this and, and just how important they may be. But it's a, it's, a, um, it's a nasty tumor that eventually causes erosion in the, in the skull to the point that it can actually cause an opening um, between the sinuses and, and the skin. It also erodes the horn um, and, and up into those sinuses, as you can see from this, from this photograph that's, that's on the, the right-hand side. Interesting enough, the, the skull came from uh, an encampment herd and uh, uh, this um, uh, picture on the right came from a bighorn sheep that was taken out, a wandering sheep that was taken out near bags. So sinus tumors are a concern because they're likely as significant in allowing the persistence of respiratory pathogens in the herd. So these, these pathogens are able to hide up in this exudate that these tumors uh, cause, um, and they eventually, as essentially hide from the immune system. Um, and another thing is, is because there's a lot of exudate that's produced in these sinus tumors, these animals are constantly sneezing and, and, blowing, and blowing mucus out of their nose. So these animals could certainly serve as a source of transmission to other members of the herd. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a identified cause or source as of yet. Some people think it's a retrovirus. Other, think, other people think it's probably bacterial. We also don't have a good way to identify those animals that have sinus tumors. Essentially, the only way to do it is to basically cut off their face so that we can look into their sinuses. Um, so it's only a postmortem diagnosis, diagnosis at this point. We do know that, this, that sinus tumors are widely distributed through most of our herd units, um, but we really don't have a good handle on prevalence yet. You know, we're really only doing surveillance through uh, uh, hunter-killed rams, so um, it's hard to get a good idea of prevalence um, just looking at rams. So moving on to Wyoming and some of the uh, some of the, pro the whiskey basin projects, and I'll talk about more about other um, uh, surveillance in the state. Many of you are aware, of course, that the goal of the whiskey basin project was to determine the primary cause of population decline and how whiskey differs from both the Jackson and Absorca herds. Um, we know we have the same class of pathogens and I'll show that in the next slide across many of the herds, but what's the difference with whiskey? Is it different strain types? What's the difference in the bugs between these three herds? Is it also a combination of maybe habitat other factors and really other unknown factors that we're not yet considering. I know that this year they started um, the comparison of the western portion of this herd, which would be very interesting. You know, the, the Green River uh, Lakes portion of the herd is doing quite well. So uh, I know that was initiated and that'll be very valuable as we try and tie that in the comparison between Jackson and Absorca. To my knowledge, this is really the first disease to try, at, or the first disease, sorry, the first study that has really tried to examine the environmental influences on respiratory disease in bighorn sheep. And it's unlikely that, that, this, that this one study is gonna answer all those questions, but it is a really good start. Um, I'm, I'm very much in support of this project. That said, this is going to be a difficult puzzle to solve, and it's likely to take more research before we, we come up with some of the answers that we're, we're really looking for. So I practiced this talk a couple times this afternoon, and I really struggled what to do with this map. So I'm gonna use this map a couple times in the next couple slides. And I decided, you know, the best thing to do is just throw it up there, let you guys get your mind wrapped around it, and then when I flow through the next couple slides, it may make more sense. At least I hope so. If it doesn't, you totally blame me, of course. But I don't want you to get really focused on what pathogens are in each herd unit. But there's some really interesting um, uh, correlations here, some patterns. If you look at our core native herds, the, the Sorkas, the Jackson, Whiskey Mountain, they all have the same pathogens. 
Um, we see a little difference in Temple Peak, but not a lot. The big difference is that amongst those three pathogens, um, Bibersteinia triolosi is present there, and it's really not found anywhere else in the state, which is kind of interesting. M. ovi is found in Laramie Peak, Temple Peak, and of course, the Absorcas, Jackson, and Whiskey Mountain. It's found in Shell Canyon as well, but it's not found in Devil's Canyon. That's a little confusing up there, the way that pie chart is done. And then you look at some of our smaller herds, the herds that have suffered some um, pretty good die off several years ago, and now I, they're just kind of a remnant herd of less than 100. Look at those, those three, uh, Darby, the encampment, Douglas Creek, um, all have basically the same pathogen populations, which is, which is really interesting. So I don't, I don't know if there's really any conclusions here. I will say that when we started out with our, with our um, project of trying to determine, okay, can we link what pathogens are in which herd with how that herd is performing? That was our goal. And the answer is a no, no, we couldn't. So if you look back and you look at that chart that I just showed you, that big map, and then, and then we relate that to um, respiratory disease and how those herds are doing. So no history of respiratory disease, that would be Devil's Canyon and uh, Cuba Canyon, um, the Fair Seminoles and the Targhee herd. You think of history of respiratory disease, but the population is doing very well. In fact, it's growing quite well. That'd be the Jackson herd. Stable populations, the Absorcas, Laramie Peak, and declining population is Whiskey. Small remnant populations that I just mentioned, following pretty big die-offs that, that occurred, um, of course, after their, their establishment would be Darby, Darby Mountain, Temple Peak, um, Encampment, and, uh, and Douglas Creek. So all those herds, as you can see, are responding differently for different reasons, obviously, um, to respiratory pathogens. So um, I, I want to point out, and this is one of my very last slides, um, why surveillance is still important. Obviously, we've been unable, at least at this point, to link pathogen presence with the performance of the herd. But that doesn't mean it isn't still important for us to continue to do surveillance, right? Because it gives us a very good idea of what the population of, of pathogens are. Excuse me, that also gives us the, the ability to identify if new pathogens should be introduced or maybe pathogens are starting to die out over time. That's, that would be good to know. Um, uh, surveillance also gives us um, the ability to perform an overall herd health assessment. We can look at lung worms and scabies and trace minerals and do serology for different diseases and, and just get a better handle on the, on the overall health of the herd. In addition, we bank samples uh, that are used um, for uh, uh, retrospective analysis, and that includes serum and cultures. So as our uh, diagnostic techniques improve and our knowledge improves, we can go back to some of these samples and just figure out how long they were uh, in some of our populations. And then finally, we, we do a lot of surveillance, particularly in our Devil's Canyon herd, because that, that herd serves as a source of translocation, at least for the Ferris Seminoles in the past. So we continue to monitor that. So anyway, over the last 10 years, we have looked at over 1,200 bighorn sheep and 100 mountain goats, which really has gotten us a pretty good handle on um, what our, how our populations are doing and what pathogens are out there. And so I, I take a, this opportunity to shout out to uh, the Wild Sheep Foundation, um, to um, uh, the Governor's Big Game License Coalition, the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, um, this is really expensive to do the surveillance and it's been a lot of work, but it's been a great goal and it's been a great, it's been a great mission. So um, I'm glad we've done it and I'm glad we've had so much support um, to get this done. Okay, just to try and summarize this, this um, presentation as, at least as best I can. Um, obviously, 
respiratory disease in bighorn sheep is incredibly complex. And as we learn more, the more we realize how complex it really is. But this is not easily disentangled, right? It's not going to be an easy uh, puzzle to solve. Certainly new pathogens pose the greatest threat to our herds and, and prevention is the key. Going back to uh, the bighorn sheep um, plan, domestic sheep plan, just doing our best to keep these animals separate. Um, also removing wandering bighorn sheep. Removal of chronically ill animals is always a good idea, as well as sometimes removing mountain goats that can serve as a, as a source of these pathogens. Strain types are really important. And again, we're just starting to get our head wrapped around them and be able to, to identify different strain types. And that's certainly gonna be important in the future as we continue to evaluate each of our, each of our uh, herds and the, and the pathogens that they carry. But at least at this point, uh, we can say with some pretty good confidence that of course, most of our bighorn sheep bighorn sheep herds are infected with respiratory pathogens, but most of them tolerate them with very limited mortality. Granted, there may be isolated pneumonia outbreaks in several locations, but as a whole, uh, the herd as a whole does quite well. That said, like I said, there is mortality under the right circumstances. Certainly more research is needed, both in the laboratory and the field. Um, we certainly need improved diagnostics for the identification of sinus tumors in live animals, um, pathogens, as well as strain types. We need better understanding of those immune responses. What makes, what's the difference between tolerance and clearance? What kind of immune reaction determines which way we're going with that? As well as better understanding of, of what triggers may be responsible for disease or a barrier to disease. And then finally, how habitat and, and other environmental stressors or competition or all those external things that we just have not really considered in the past. How do those factor into this equation and, and what can we do to try and improve the overall health of a herd um, by maybe manipulating some of those environmental uh, factors just, just to get a better understanding. All right, well, you have successfully endured another Hank Edwards presentation. Um, I have lots of time for questions and I'm happy to um, take some now. Let me stop sharing. I have one question so far. All right. It says, um, what an informative talk. Thank you. Do sheep have a weakness in their lungs that makes them more susceptible to these lung pathogens that develop more as they age? Like large old bull elk can be more susceptible to scabies. That's a good question. My gut reaction or gut response would be yes. As an animal gets older, they are very likely more susceptible to um, maybe some of these pathogens. When that happens, uh, I don't know that. I don't know how old an animal has to be before they become more susceptible. But certainly, like I mentioned earlier, um, the, the bighorn sheep's white blood cells are just more susceptible to the leukotoxins that are put out by many of these pathogens at any age. See, and then Kathy Trainer asks, uh, with your overall herd health assessment, what trace minerals were studied and where? We are studying trace minerals in two forms. So one is we do it by serum. And we do that through all herds across the state and um, compare those uh, to all herds across the state. But we also look at liver, uh, trace minerals in the liver. So that can be from adults and from lambs. So any mortalities that we get um, across the state, we are analyzing those trace minerals. I don't have a list here in front of me, I wish I did but it is a pretty extensive list of all the, the trace minerals that we are, are looking at. 
All right, the next question I see is from Ryan Martin. Does your lab perform much testing of domestic sheep and goat herds near bighorn sheep populations? That's a great question. And actually that is something that we are requested to do quite frequently. But, you know, we really stray away from that just because of the potential conflict of interest, or at least how that might appear as far as conflicts of interest. So we don't do it. We, we simply refer them either to um, the Wyoming State Veterinary Laboratory, or we refer them to uh, the Washington Animal uh, Disease Diagnostic Laboratory. Okay, and Katie Cheesebro from the Wyoming Wild Sheep Foundation says, hey, hey, great talk. With the increase of folks recreating in the backcountry and the potential use of pack goats and llamas, are there any concerns of pathogen disease transmission to bighorn sheep from these domestic species? Yeah, that's, that's a thorny subject. Um, you know, from the research that I'm aware of, Pack goats are a lot less of a concern than weed goats. And a lot of that has to do with the way they're um, raised, where weed goats are maybe similar to um, domestic sheep, where they're bought at auction, they're traded here and there. Um, whereas pack goats um, are, are raised from a very young age, and there's a lot less trading and um, uh, milling with other herds, at least that's the way I understand it. So um, they're less of a concern. Uh, and llamas um, are probably less of a concern as well. So, um, you know, I think any, all those are a concern, whether it be llamas or pack goats or weed goats or whatever, but certainly um, they're less of a concern than domestic sheep and probably less of a concern than um, uh, weed goats. I'm not sure I answered your question, Katie. I think I just completely danced right around that answer. But um, uh, talk, to, um, talk to Doug McWhorter. He's well, well versed, as is Daryl Lutz, in that, um, in that uh, controversy. Okay, then the next one is from Mackenzie from the Bighorn Sheep Center. Can you talk about potential for disease transmission between mountain goats and bighorns in the Tetons? Um, yes, so we have done quite a bit of surveillance of those big, of those um, mountain goats that occur in the Palisades there and along the Snake River Canyon, not the Palisades, sorry, the Snake River Canyon. And we find that those um, mountain goats have a wide range of pathogens from Hemolytica and, and Movi and uh, Bibostrania triolosi. They have the full suite. Whereas the mountain goats that are currently in the, in the Tetons are, are less um, infected with some of those pathogens. So the concern is, since obviously those, those mountain goats have made their way from the um, uh, Snake River to the, the Tetons, that, um, that eventually they're going to bring some of those pathogens to the bighorn sheep. Uh, certainly they share the same range, and uh, uh, as far as we know, they're the same pathogen. So in my mind, uh, mountain goats do present a threat to that, to that herd in the Tetons. And Ryan Martin asks, do medications or vaccines exist to address these same issues within domestic sheep herds? They do exist, um, but they're not very good. Unfortunately, most of the vaccines that are out there just aren't very effective against many of the pasturellas. That doesn't mean that uh, many domestic sheep producers don't use them, but they certainly have the ability to revaccinate those animals every year or as needed. Um, so, um, and as far as medications go, you know, we've certainly done a lot of research with bighorn sheep, and there are some antibiotics out there that are very specific for, say, hemolytica, but we just have not had any success in treating either the lambs or the ewes, quite honestly, prior to, prior to when they give birth, there just hasn't been any success so far with, with uh, medications or, or vaccines as far as that goes. Okay, 
Okay, and then Michelle says, uh, the Whiskey Mountain herd was the premier herd many years ago and was used as transplants. Why are the sheep not developing antibodies on their own, which they would then pass on to the lambs? Another really good question. And that is unknown. I, I did some reading up on that um, prior to this presentation. And it's interesting that for whatever reason, bighorn sheep simply don't produce a strong antibody response to either the leukotoxin or to the surface of the, of the bacterial cells, in, especially in comparison to domestic sheep, which have a huge uh, response. So the, the amount of antibodies that uh, bighorn sheep produce are, are minuscule compared to domestic sheep. And then for whatever reason, they, like I said, they don't produce those antibodies. So therefore they don't show up in their colostrum and eventually protect that lamb. But it has been shown that domestic sheep can certainly produce lots of antibodies to other pathogens. So what is it about their response to these bacterial pathogens or, leuco or the leukotoxin um, is really unknown. So we really don't know why they don't mount a much better response to some of these pathogens because they've certainly been living with them for quite some time. Right, any other questions? I'll hear from Kathy Trainer. Would you please share your bighorn sheep pathogenic surveillance in Wyoming 2011 to 2019 with the Bighorn Center? Yes, okay. I will. You are welcome to that. Um, welcome to that map. It needs to be updated. I apologize for that. I've not had time to put the 2020 data into that, but I will add that to my list of things to do. And when it's complete, I will send it to you. Okay. And we can, we can share it on our website for anyone who's interested. Um, so I guess I'm curious and maybe I missed it. We were dealing with some issues with the link to your um, presentation. Um, how many different strains of mycoplasma ovi pneumonia are there at this point? That are known? I don't know exactly how many strains. I know that Dr. Besser is still working on that. Um, but I, as far as I know, he's uncovered several strains. I'm sorry, I couldn't tell you exactly how many. But I, I guess I'd heard that there were over 100. Is that accurate? I, I would not be surprised. Okay, wow. Great. Any other questions from anyone? Okay, well, if not, um, thank you so much, Hank, for sharing all this valuable information with us. And thanks to everyone who joined in. Um, we also want to thank our partners, Wyoming Game and Fish Department, the Wild Sheep Foundation, and the Wyoming Wild Sheep Foundation for all their work um, in wildlife conservation and for always supporting us. And if anyone thinks of any questions later, you can get them to me or someone at the Sheep Center and we can get in touch with Hank. Um, so thanks a lot, everybody. And you'll have a good evening. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks, Hank. Thanks, Karen.